All right, everyone, welcome back to the Sober Bartender Podcast. I would like you all to help me welcome my next guest, Starla. Starla, welcome. Hello, welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So guys, Starla has an incredible story and uh, I only know a little bit about it. So Starla, do you want to let us know who you are and what you do and where you come from? Absolutely. So uh, my name is Starla Jocelyn. And um, I'm a mother of six. Um, I am a salon owner. Um, I moved to the Corpus Christi area in March of 2017. And um, I own a salon here. Um, I'm also a recovering addict. And um, yeah, I'm just extremely involved in my community. That's awesome. Mother of six. I did not yes. know that. Yeah, so I have five boys. They are 20, 16, well, 20, 17, 16, 15, and nine. And then I have a daughter that's three. Oh my goodness. Your hands are full. Yes. And you run a business and you're active yes. in the community. Yes. Wow. So you're, um. so you've been sober for how long? Eight years and seven months. That is incredible. Eight years and seven months. And uh, so do you want to tell us, do you mind telling us a little bit about uh, what it was like, like leading up to getting sober? Well, so I tried to get sober several, several times. And um, I would, um, I would clean myself up. I would go to a few meetings. I would pass my drug test and everything, but I never completely submitted to the program and to the 12 steps. Um, so that was why I kept relapsing, but also at all those times, I didn't think that I was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. I only considered myself a drug addict. So I would quit using meth, but I would still keep drinking and so eventually the alcohol would lead me back to meth because if eventually it wasn't strong enough for because my doc is a lot stronger you know mm -hmm. so um but uh i don't know what's nuts is i had three years of no meth at all three years and um then i relapsed for four months and um something very catastrophic happened in my life at that time and so um i've been sober ever since so, but it's been a lot of hard work and, um, it, it's not just, I'm, I wasn't that one that could say that prayer and just automatically be healed. You know, it has been a lot of hard work and it's still today, a lot of hard work. Yeah. And that's something that a lot of people encounter when like you have multiple things going on is you think this isn't like alcohol, isn't my problem. Like this is my problem. This is what's mm -hmm. screwing up my life. And if I just beat this thing. I'll be okay. Not realizing that the alcohol is still, you know, it's still right there leading you back to that thing. Right. And, you know, a lot of people in addiction, we switch it, you know, we'll go from one addiction to the other. And that's exactly what I did because I was drinking every single day, you know, and that's hard on your body, hard on your liver, you know, everything. So, and hard on your life. <laughs> Absolutely. And yeah. I, I did learn that, uh, you know, the 12 steps taught me like the most important thing that it taught me is that I was filling like a God-sized hole inside myself. And so it didn't matter what it was, whether it was drugs or whether it was people or whether it was mm -hmm. alcohol, that what I needed to recover was myself. Like I needed to get, I needed to fill that hole, like that spirit, like that. Well, uh, and like what you just said there um, hit me because when you said people, so I was a serial monogamous girl and mm -hmm. I, I cloned that. So that's my term because I would go from one serious relationship to the next one. I was never a dope whore. I was never those things, you know, but I did go from one serious relationship to the next. And I married a guy that I met in Alcoholics Anonymous and we were both sober. He had two and a half years. He had been um, in a discipleship program, you know, so he had all the right words to say in that meeting, but I was three months clean when I met mm -hmm. him, you know, <laughs> so I turned him into my higher power. You know, and then I saw myself do that again another time when I got clean. So what my biggest prayer was this time was to keep me away from men 
And I was able to stay by myself and celibate for three years. So that was my, that's what God knew I needed because I would, I would make that man my higher power every single time, you know? Yes. Yes, I do. <laughs> I too, um, I too am a serial monogamist, you know, it's like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not person to person in short periods of time, but absolutely mm -hmm. it was 11 years and then it was two and a half years and then it, you know, yeah. And, um, I did, I couldn't see those things about myself. You know, it was just, we feed off of that emotion, right? Like yeah. I feel this way. And so I need to act on how I'm feeling so that I can feel different. Yeah. So something that I did want to ask you is, um, you know, with longer term sobriety, like I've been sober two years, I know how to stay sober one day at a time for two years. But what I found previously, like I relapsed previously and, um, I, uh, I noticed that when my life starts getting good, that's mm -hmm. when like my forgetting starts. That's when it right. kicks in of like, oh, my life is good. I could probably handle it now. Not realizing that the idea that I would ever want to put that back in my body is my alcoholism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and that's well how the devil tricks us. You know what I mean? He doesn't have to fight so hard when we're using and when we're in that life. But the second that we go away, then he wants to put those little lies Oh, you can handle just one. No, bitch, I can't handle just one. Get behind me, you know? But it's taken, you know, all, I mean, girl, I was in and out for 11 years, you know? And so the the biggest challenge that I can tell people trying to stay clean is go back and look at all those times when you relapsed. Go back and maybe essay on that. You know, what what happened in that time? What was devastating or or what were you not doing? You know what I mean? And you can kind of break it down and be like, okay, I can see where I was drawn away from my sober contacts or I wasn't going to my meeting. You know what I mean? And you can see that pattern, you know, but you know, <clears throat> where I'm at now, um, I still attend some meetings, but, and I don't want to say this and try, I don't want to offend people in the recovery community by any means at all because it was there for me and it was a good thing for me at that time but right now where I am in my life I need to rub elbows with people that are a lot smarter than me mm -hmm. and that are more successful than me and so um I'm just spreading in my wings into other places you know what I mean <laughs> yeah I feel like our recovery it needs to grow in different ways and so recovery in the beginning for me needed to be like super structured daily meetings. Yes. You know, it, it looked a different way than it looks now, two years from now. And I'm assuming that when I'm where you're at, at eight years and seven months, it's going to look different than two. Absolutely. It will. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that, that makes sense. So if people get offended, we all know that we're not responsible for right. True. How <laughs> other people take the way that, you know, that's that my say. biggest character defect still what other people think of me. And I, I struggle with it all the time, you know, and it, it really affects me with my career and everything, but yeah, it's my biggest. Yeah. <laughs> well, my sponsor would tell me, <laughs> she would say that I can't fix my defects and that's God's work. So when I recognize it, all I have to do is go, God, please take this for me. It's not right. Me. True. There you go. So yeah. Little reminder from early, early sobriety that. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. For um, sure. So, uh, what was I going to ask you is, um, um, give me one second. I'm going to pause and edit this out because I had a good thought. <laughs> okay. You're fine. <laughs> um, what was it? Okay. Well, we'll move on to that thought okay. at another time. Um, so, um, we were talking about, um, like meetings and me meeting frequency. So like, like I said, in the beginning, I went to a meeting every single day, multiple uh -huh. meetings a day. And then I got to the point where it was like three for maintenance, four for growth. And now I like yourself, like I'm starting a business and now I'm starting a podcast and like my recovery looks totally different. And I'm able to see that the things that help me recover are talking to people like you, like it doesn't need to be just in a meeting space right. and hearing those same things every day. Like it's carrying the message in a different way than just sitting across the table from somebody else. <clears throat> 
So for you, like, do you feel like is recovery still up? Do you feel like I feel like everything that I do is part of my recovery? <laughs> like, is that the case or is it just life now? Well, um, I, my recovery still um, is a part of my everyday life. And I see it the most as how I am able. Girl, it's crazy. I would say probably one in three of my clients have an alcoholic husband. Oh, so they come and vent to me or, you know what I mean? Or they have a family member that's struggling. And so it's just crazy how the Holy Spirit will speak to me and tell me to share my story. You know, that's where I'm finding my recovery and my story to be its biggest impact right now. That makes so, so much sense. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cause that's how I met you was by you talking to someone else, like a client, you know, told me about you, about your story. Exactly. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. And I, I share only if someone asks me while I'm at work, like I'm yeah. a bartender, you know, normally it won't come up, but when people go, Oh, can I buy you a shot? Or, Oh, so-and-so it's, you know, going through this, I can say like, there's another way. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that way. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so, um, I love seeing like the examples of what can happen. Like, I don't know who you were, before, but I'm guessing that you weren't a salon owner and, you know, not. Um, so I owned a salon in West Texas. I've been in the industry for 21 years. I'm pretty oh. much a, a, a functioning addict. Okay. Um, so, but like I had shot my credit and all of that. And then I had to move here and start completely over after getting out of rehab, you know? So I lost everything in West Texas, but yeah, I, I, I think I've done very well for myself. Um, I've only been here for six years, you know, and I've, I've just been hit the ground running, you know? So, but yeah, um, I don't know, girl. Um, <laughs> cause it's I, just, I mean, it's I incredible growing. when we get all that stuff out of the way. Like I didn't have to figure everything out. Like the things that I wanted just started coming into my path. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, well, I'll tell you one thing. So when I when I first got clean, the, like the first few weeks that I was sober, I read the book, The Secret. And yes, I'm a Christian. And yes, I believe in, in Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has saved me. But through this sobriety, because I was born, I was raised Southern Baptist. My dad was a deacon in the Baptist church. It was, you know, mm -hmm. hellfire and broomsticks and black and white, nothing in between, right? Well, through the last eight years, I have become way more spiritual and not religious. So yes, I still believe in, in the works of the Bible, but I also believe that um, we can have, a, there's, there's spiritual things that are maybe not listed in there. So I read the book, The Secret, which is based on the New Testament, but it was an eye opener to me on things that I was shorting myself on, um, things that I didn't even realize that I was doing in my brain that was causing all this chaos. Um, and so I read that book three times and then I started doing all of the visuals that it, it suggested. And did you know that I'm sitting in a two-story house right now that looks like the picture that I drew on the wall eight, eight years and seven months ago? So the power of our mind is just insane. And if we can learn how to do those positive thoughts, and learn how to speak positivity and learn how to manifest exactly what we want. It's all here given to us, you know? And I just, I've just ran with that. And yes, I still have the stinking thinking. I still have like self-worth issues, you know? But as far as like um, learning how to use my mind to attract what I want and to, and to hustle for what I want, I, I'm, I'm conquering that part, you know? Yes. So uh, I will tell you, like, ask and it is given. Like, I follow mm -hmm. Abraham Hicks. So uh, law of attraction, same yeah. concepts. And mm -hmm. um, it doesn't interfere because I'm I'm not a Christian, per se. Like, I believe in God and God saved my life completely. Uh -huh. um, but not so much uh, Bible-based. So my, my uh, you know, I'm very spiritual. Yeah. Strongly connected. And... I've learned that like it was the 12 steps that taught me that necessary action because I was the reader of the book, but never the taker of the action. I right. still wouldn't change my thoughts. I still wouldn't right. make the vision board. I still wouldn't, you know, 
take the initiative to put those things into play. So I'm so glad you brought that up because that is absolutely. It is so powerful. And I try, okay. I used to sponsor girls for a long time. I don't have time to anymore, but that was my biggest thing is read this book, change your thinking, learn to love yourself, you know? And mm -hmm. it is, it's, it's, I don't know. I think it's the most powerful thing for women in recovery, especially if you've been through abusive relationships or sexual abuse, you know what I mean? Like we have got to change that mindset or you're never going to be able to get clean, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it, you know, it's one thing, like it's super hard to get clean and then to stay that way. Like your life needs to change. Absolutely. So it's a lifestyle it, change, not just sobriety. Yeah. Yeah. So we go in thinking like, oh, I just need to get rid of this one thing, not realizing that it's a little bit of everything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love that you read The Secret. I love that it's changed your life and you're sitting in the house. Yes. Yeah. I um, Absolutely. I feel like the more people hear about it, like I say, I didn't, uh, I didn't read The Secret, but like I fell onto Abraham Hicks, like YouTube videos and um, just the whole lot. Check him out. What's that? I said, I'll have to check him out. Oh yeah. It's actually, so it's a, it's a couple, Jerry and Esther Hicks, and okay. she channels uh, a spirit that's uh, Abraham and speaks the law of attraction basically. So it gets a little okay. confusing when you're, you know, religious, but if you're open to spiritual teachings, then a lot comes through. Okay. But yeah. So, um, cool. As far as being like active in your community, like, do you just feel so motivated to put good into the world because you feel so good? Absolutely. So, um, I, when I first got here, I was completely broke and, um, I was on food stamps and I was living at my parents' house with just three of my kids. And, um, I would go give free haircuts to the men at broken chains because I didn't have any money to tithe. And so that was my way of giving back. Well, it's just like snowballed. And um, now my mom, who's 72 years old, does free haircuts every Wednesday at the Church Unlimited Westside Campus. And then I help her once a month. Then I'm also a Rotarian. Um, so I'm a member of the Downtown Evening Rotary Club. And um, we do so much for the community. Um, and it's just like, we need to though, you know what I mean? Especially being a business owner in this community, I want my community to be, to be nice, you know, and I want to be connected, you know, and that's the big thing is we're really connected. We, we do about two or three big events a year and um, it's all for women and children. And yeah, I love being a part of that. And then I'm also in a sorority <clears throat> called the Sparkling City Queens <laughs> and we dress up in these outlandish outfits and we go and make appearances at like fundraisers for nonprofits. So I'm everywhere. <laughs> Sparkling city Queens. I love that. You'll have to get, you'll have to look on my Facebook page. There's we're, we're wearing red wigs and we're taking people. So if you want to be a queen, um, you can read the book. <laughs> we're taking applications. Okay. I'll have to look into that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It does not sound terrible. No, it's super fun. But yeah, I'm just, I, I, what's nuts is like, you know, I've always done hair. I've always, but when you're on drugs and you're drinking, you don't have time to give yourself back, you know? And so I'm able to take the time that I would have been looking for dope to be able to get back to my community now. And, um, as far as like your kids go, they really range in ages. So your youngest was never a part of that, but do you like, it's, your older kids, like they really get to see the huge change. Oh, absolutely. And they're super proud of me. Yes. That's a great. You get to be that example and show them yes. what's possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm having another, <laughs> another block. It's going to be a day. Um, so what, um, what words do you have for people? Well, you already gave us words for early recovery, but like for myself, as far as like staying the course of like staying in it when things get good, like, I don't know why. When well, my okay. Life this is my ahead. thing. Where, where's the nastiest place that, that recovery or that's, um, Addiction. use ever took you. Tell me, describe it to me. I want to know what the floor looked like. I want to know what the walls looked like. Describe to me the nastiest place that your addiction ever took. 
you too. Um, it was definitely, it was a whole entire like time period. Like okay. it was, yeah, it was. Uh, okay. So every time you get that urge, you have to put that thought in your mind. Mm -hmm. You have to remind yourself because the devil tries to trick you. And he tries to say, oh, remember how fine you looked in that dress? Oh, wait. You know what I mean? Like he tries to bring up all these wonderful memories and all the fun times that we had, or we couldn't do that without alcohol, or we couldn't do that without, you know what I mean? So we have to keep that ingrained in our brain, that nastiest place that we were ever at, Yeah, you know, yeah. and it's got, and it's got to be for, for, first and foremost, you know? And that did come up. So that the thing that I did differently after my relapse is when I did a first step with the sponsor that I have now, we got... Um, the first step wasn't just, yes, I'm powerless over alcohol and my life is unmanageable. It was examples of each oh, okay, yeah. in depth. Yeah. And so I had to paint that picture and I have it in a notebook. Mm -hmm. yes. anytime. So I don't have the desire to drink, but what I do feel come up sometimes is like, I don't so much, maybe I don't need to, you know, be so active in this or so, you know, it just, it changes. So, so the, the, your mind is trying to say, maybe don't go to this meeting. Maybe don't go to this. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Or okay. yeah, just more so like you're good now. And it's like, but I'm good because I'm doing these things. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> you know, everybody's is different. You can't ever put a timeline on everybody's, but I think, I mean, I don't know. I still just, I go to one meeting a week, but when I was, I still went to probably two or three till I was at six years probably, but I was also involved. I was running the women's house, you know what I mean? So, but I think everybody, everybody's program is different. You know, I know some people that went to meetings for maybe six months and they got 20 years sober and they haven't really embraced the program again, you know? Yeah. But I don't know. I do know for now that it absolutely makes my life better. I know that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh-huh. It's just like feeling like, oh, I could use a cup of coffee. It's like, oh, I could use a meeting. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so did you learn the five daily tools whenever you first got sober? Um, no, I didn't necessarily hear about the five daily tools until I moved to Corpus. Okay. Yeah. Those five daily tools are very powerful. I think that if someone can grasp onto that, but I mean, it's got the meeting in there. It's got your literature. It's got all of that, you know? And I think that that needs to be something to grasp on for the first 90 days. But I also think that if, if you have a sick family member or, you know, you're going through a breakup, any of those things, doesn't matter how much we have, we need to resort back to those tools. You know what I mean? So let's go ahead and share those tools for people that don't know okay. what we're talking about. Okay. So the first one is we're going to pray for strength to stay sober for the day. That's going to be our first thing when we wake up in the morning. Mm -hmm. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to read some spiritual literature, something that's going to motivate us to stay sober. It could be the Bible. It could be your daily, daily or whatever, one daily thing, something like that. Mm -hmm. Your third one is you're going to hit a meeting. And number four is you're going to reach out to a sober contact. You need to make sure that you're in contact with somebody in the program every single day. Hey, I'm alive. You know, just making sure you're making contact. And number five, you're going to give thanks. Thank you, Lord, for giving me another day of sobriety before you go to bed at night. Yep. Yeah, those are posted on the wall at the New Phoenix Club um, here yeah. in Corpus Christi. Awesome. And I never saw that before, but they were just things that my sponsor suggested I do. And I was desperate enough to just do them. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and now I would say I still do every single one of those things, except I don't go to a meeting every single day. Yeah. But cool. yeah. Yeah, it's that powerful. is powerful. Yeah. So where did you move from? I moved here from Seattle. Yeah, my um I was in Vegas for 15 years. That's where I originally um went to detox and got sober. And then in COVID, I was 11 months and like 20 days sober, but not going to meetings, not praying, not meditating, like just in like personal chaos but not drinking. And I moved to Seattle to go after an ex that I hadn't talked to in years. So I, you know, moved up there and then I drank the day I got there right before my first one year. And, um, 
and we got married two months later and we got divorced, you know, six months later. And it was oh, just, wow. it was a pretty gnarly deal. But when I was up there, I was isolated from all of my support system. And the only place that I had to go was AA. Like I knew that that was where I would right. go because I was getting suicidal with the shame of the relapse and that. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So that like completely changed everything. And then up there, I met my current husband and. And he brought you to Corpus? Um, yeah, he's a, a baseball coach for Texas A&M Corpus. Oh, so that's how you know. Yeah, so that's how okay. I know our mutual friend is. Yeah, oh, okay. our, our husbands knew each other from the coaching world. And then uh, their family moved here. And then my husband got offered the job and we went for it. Cool. And it was the job was offered a week before our wedding. So we just got married July 30th. And oh, cool. Yeah. So awesome. But I got to Corpus and I had kind of, you know, I was going to meetings, but just was kind of not really feeling connected. And so I just, I started this podcast and I started meeting people and it's totally like shifted everything. That's awesome. That's way awesome. So have you tried any other meetings besides New Phoenix? Yeah, I go to the Anchor Club pretty frequently and then I go cool. over to the, uh, to the island. Cool. I live on I, the bluff, I used to go so. to the Anchor Club like. Gosh, it's like nine or 10 years ago when I would come visit my parents over here. I would go to Anchor. Yeah. Yeah. There's, cool. They they got hit hard by COVID. A lot of meetings um, from what I hear got hit hard by COVID. Um, so they just have a daily noon and then a women's on Wednesday. So, oh, okay. But I'm on, you know, I live in Flower Bluff. So it's nice having a around the corner little meeting hall. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But my home group is uh, the New Phoenix. Do you know Anita at New Phoenix? I've met Anita, but I don't know her well. Mm -hmm. She she was my first sponsor here. Oh, neat. Yeah. So she's been there for a long time. And I hear she yeah. works with a lot of women. Uh-huh. And I found, like, I'm a sponsor, but I've found, like, working with one to two women at a time is, like, all that God has given me. So I'm assuming that that's... <laughs> Yeah, that's the max of what I need because I'm doing so many other things that you know. Mm -hmm. And in our lineage, we do three contacts a day. Like we do an eleven step prayer or a, a meditation and journaling, and that's shared between sponsor and sponsee, and then a check in call daily, and then uh, you know a. Inventory. Oh well, y'all are y'all are rigorous. Yeah, we yeah, are yeah, yeah. Uh, completely. Yeah, so I still have you I've, ever been to an Oso meeting? They're even more strict than that. Uh -uh, I have not. Okay. So if you ever go to the Oso club, they may like, they don't want y'all, their sponsees going to any other meeting. Oh, they only want you going to theirs. Yeah. No, we definitely encourage going to, mm -hmm. you know, getting other, out of yeah, your comfort because you're going to hear other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Too, no. But yeah, we're, it's, it's interesting. Cause I really, that was the opposite of what I wanted, but it's what saved me like that rigorous structure. And mm -hmm. so now I'm, I'm to the point where I'm trying to learn how to go with the flow again. Yeah. <laughs> Cause I'm like so regimented in everything. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, as far as sponsorship goes, we're a very rigorous lineage. Yeah. That nightly inventory, you know, I close the bar at 3am and then I get home and then I'm getting on my spiritual toolkit app for those listeners that aren't familiar. Like there's an app where it goes through and asks you the questions like, were we resentful? Were we selfish? You know, what could we have done better? Were we kind and loving towards all? And so that keeps you pretty in touch with your recovery. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. And you know, it, it some days it feels exhausting, but most, most days I just remember that I get to do that. Like I exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I get to do that. So I so appreciate you talking to me. Like I, I love hearing what recovery has done for your life. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, because I just, you know, the purpose of this show is just to show not only that it's possible to stop, but that your life looks nothing like what you thought it would once you do, like it can go in any direction, any direction. It's, it's just the, the, you know, the United States is a place of endless possibilities, you know, and um, I have lots of international clients and I just love to hear that from them, you know, and, and all we have to do is hustle a little bit, you know, work hard, be honest, 
stay sober and things happen, you know? Absolutely. I love it. Well, Starla, thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. I'm going to share. Is there like, do you mind if I share your, your contact info? If anyone wants to reach out or has questions, I'll just share that in the show notes. Yeah. You can put my phone number is the, um, do you have my number? Cause it's my shop number. Um, I do. I have it saved in my phone. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's my shop number. So yeah. That's perfect. Okay. We're going to.